Shalom, shalom everyone. Grace and peace be unto you. We are back again. We are back to look into the word and I pray that you are all well and you are off to a great start. I pray that you will have a great and productive week as you put your 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 life in the hand of the creator, the awesome God, the creator of the universe. I'm Apostle Claudia Morgan Senior and again it is a pleasure to be here to share the word. Today we're going to be talking about the holiness of the wilderness. The holiness of the wilderness, yes. And as we talk about wilderness, two things would pop into mind. The children of Israel going through the wilderness and the Yeshua, <coughs> I'm sorry, when he was tempted by the enemy in the wilderness. And so as hard as it may seem as we talk about the wilderness, I pray today that this word will bring you hope as you will learn that the wilderness is not as bad as we may have been taught, right? It's not as bad as we may have been taught because God's divine presence is very active even in the wilderness. And that's what we're gonna be looking at today. And based on what um, scripture reveals, we can say that the wilderness, the wilderness is a holy place. Let us get into it before you begin to have your own discussion on the text that we're looking at. Okay, so the text that we're reading, looking at today is from St. Matthew chapter 4, and it tells of the temptation of Yeshua, and um, a few verses that I may not read in totality, but for whatever it is, it says, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert, and uh, the desert and the wilderness we can use interchangeably, right? to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to come to become bread. He answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. All right, I'll stop here for now and we may read a little, a few more verses later down. <clears throat> Also, Exodus chapter 5, verse 1, it's a one verse that we're going to use here today. And it says, Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, Let my people go, so they may hold a festival for me in the wilderness or in the desert. All right? So, the children of Israel. We're just closing out this study on the book of um, Genesis. We did that last week. And so the children of Israel, as we know, they were in Egypt, Joseph died, and they are now under the brutality of a new Pharaoh who did not know Joseph or his people. Um, and the plan of the enemy, you know, is to keep us in bondage, is to keep you in bondage, is to keep you in slavery, is to keep you in Egypt. Yes, Egypt is not uh, only a geographical location, but it's also a state of mind. And no wonder the Apostle Paul wrote, stand fast in the liberty where Christ has made you free and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Right? Whom the Son has set free is free indeed, and we need to maintain that freedom. And so the Hebrew word, you're going to be learning, and you would have learned, you'd have noticed by now that in a lot of the sessions that I do, I tend to bring in Hebrew word, words, because the Hebrew meaning is very dimensional, and I believe the Hebrew meaning of words give us a deeper understanding of what the scripture really is, right? So the Hebrew word for Egypt is Mitzarim. It means a place of straight, a place of not enough a place of limitation or a place of narrowness. And so if you are in that place in Egypt, God is actually calling you out of that place, out of that place of narrowness, out of that place of limitation, out of that place of not enough, because he wants to take you into his abundance, into the promised land. And in the same way he called Abraham, 
right and you tell him to get out of your country get out of your land get out of you know from among your people because i'm taking you into a land i want to show you a land i want to take you into something new into something of greater abundance and of greater blessing yeshua also called his disciples and he says come follow me right and uh, so we we look at this and we see the importance of coming out of Egypt, that is, and of following. And once we start to follow, there should be no turning back. Because when God takes us out of Egypt, the Egypt of this world, and he brings us his deliverance through the atoning blood of the Messiah, we should have a determined effort not to go back into the world, not to go back into what is called Egypt, right? But we should be determined to keep our, our, our walk on this path as we go through. So in keeping with the promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, verse 12, it says, this is what God says to Abraham. He says, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be slaves and mistreated for 400 years, but I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possession. And as you read through the book of Exodus, which we, I, I'm sure I'll come back to do some more sharing on this, we're going to see that Israel left Egypt very rich because of all that God has promised to them, right? So here at this point, Israel, they were on the cusp of experiencing their deliverance. And so in Exodus chapter 5, verse 1, as we read, the Lord says through Moses and Aaron, tell Pharaoh, this is what the Lord, the Lord God of Israel says, let my people go so that they may hold a festival for me in the wilderness. Let my people go so they can hold a festival for me in the wilderness. But why the wilderness? Right? God made the promise to Abraham, you know, he promised him a land. But to get to the promised land, they had to go through the wilderness. The children of Israel had to cross the, the Red Seas to get out of the land of Egypt. And they also have to cross the Jordan River to get into the promised land. So it is all about the journey, the journey that we are in and our final destination. So you may ask, if God is bringing them Israel, that is, in deliverance, right? If he's taking them out of bondage, out of slavery, out of Egypt, why would he take them into the wilderness? And as far as we know, in our minds, the, the, the wilderness is not a very nice place, right? It's not a very nice place as we know it. The wilderness is not a very nice place, right? So, um... It is a place of spiritual warfare. We read from St. Matthew chapter 4, Yeshua battle with the enemy. So it's a place of spiritual warfare. It's a place of barrenness. It's a place where nothing really thrives, right? It's a place where not much really happens. But is that all there really is to the wilderness? Today, we'll be learning about the wilderness and we're going to be looking at it, you know, because it has greater spiritual significance for the, for the people who belong to God. And for the people who belong to God, that is how you need to view this, that the experiences of your lives, like that of the wilderness, it is really like that of the wilderness. Because you are not of the world, you cannot look at what is happening around you um, from just a physical perspective, right? We need to see the wilderness as that special place where God gave his laws, where he revealed his presence to Israel and established his everlasting covenant all of that happened 
in the wilderness. And so we can now look at the wilderness. And based on what we see to agree that the wilderness is a holy place where we are drawn to God. We are able to pull ourselves to God. I want us to look at the Hebrew word for wilderness. It is called Midbar, right? And it comes from the root word Davar, which means to speak. So the wilderness is a place where God speaks, where you hear his voice, where he pulls you from all the distractions that are around to allow you to hear his will and his purpose to complete your life. That was the purpose of Israel going through the wilderness. It was a training ground for their development as a nation, right? And as physical Israel in their exile had to go through, right? So to we who are in covenantal walk with God in our own exile, on our journey to our promised land, we too must go through, we need to understand the purpose of what is happening here. We learn from scripture and I, I, I want to highlight some of the persons who have had these wilderness experiences. Because from the scripture, we learn comfort. From the scripture, we see the divine hand of God at work. And there are many who have gone through these experiences and that has left life changing event for us to look back at, to help our own walk with the Lord, right? And so I want to start with Moses. And we know Mo Moses, the prophet Moses, foreshadow of the Messiah is a foreshadowing of the Messiah, right? But in Exodus chapter, th chapter 3, God brought Moses to the desert. We know he was basically running away out of Egypt. We know the story of what happened in Egypt. He killed an Egyptian and all that. That story is very familiar to everyone, right? And so this is where he was on the backside, in the desert. And it, he, it, the word says he came to Horeb, right? The mountain of God. And so we understand that Horeb and Mount Sinai, they are really the same mountain. And at this place he appeared, he saw flames of fire from within a bush. And though the bush was burning, right? It did not really burn up. But God would use this event, right? To speak to Moses through the burning bush. And it was also God's way of getting his attention. It was God's way of getting his attention. And so we, 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 we read later in the book of Exodus that Moses fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Yes, fasting means he went without food. He went without water. For, he, for him to hear clearly the word of God, for him to hear clearly and receive the instructions that God was going to give to him, he had to separate himself, right? And uh, to, to, to receive the instructions are, the word instruction also means Torah, right? Or teachings. As a matter of fact, Moses had to go to Mount Sinai on three different occasions for three 40-day periods, right? Yes, at three different times, he spent 40 days at Mount, upon the Mount. So God was making for himself a people. Why was it? Why was all this necessary? Because God was making for himself a people and a nation to fulfill his mission. It is all about God. And we, we saw him working with Moses through going through the wilderness. Then we come to Elijah. In 1 Kings 19, we read that Elijah flees to Horeb, same Mount Sinai, right? Same Mount as, as Moses did. And of course, it is all happening in the wilderness. He was on a 40 days journey and he was on a mission, right? Basically, 
he was hiding, he was running away from Jezebel because Jezebel was out to get him, right? And he ended up at this place, right? And uh, the text says that, that God appeared to him. In, in um, 1 Kings chapter 19, God appeared to him and uh, a great powerful wind tore the mountains and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. <clears throat> After the wind, here was an earthquake, but he was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but he was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And in that moment, in the wilderness, God assured Elijah that there are 700 prophets in Israel who had not bowed to Baal or kiss him. We are talking about the holiness of the wilderness. And I want you to understand it doesn't matter what your wilderness experience may be like right now. I want you to know that in the same way God appeared to Elijah in that still small voice, in the quietness of the moment, in that moment, the, the Lord appeared with a word and he gave him assurance in the wilderness. Right? I think that's an amen. We should give an amen to that one. And so, yes, we look also at John the Baptist in St. John chapter 1. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Who was John the Baptist? He was the forerunner of Yeshua, the Messiah. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. Right? And so we know the scripture he quoted was from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, which says, The voice of him that cried in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his way straight. All of these things happen in the wilderness. Amen. And then we get to Yeshua, as we read from, say, Matthew chapter 4. The Spirit drove him. He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So in the wilderness, he was there for another, he was there for a 40 day and I think without food because he needed to be connected with God. He knew his mission, the mission he was on, and he knew that mission could not be completed, you know, um, in his own strength or in his own effort. So he knew he had to rely on God. He had to deny absolutely everything to get to the place where he could connect to God. It is said that the wilderness west of the Jordan near Jericho is a desolate, dry, and thirsty land, right? And um, under the heat of the blazing sun, a man without shade and water might die in a single day because of the heat and no water. Person could die in a single day. But hear this, in that same place, Yeshua fasted for 40 days, right? In that same desolate land in the wilderness. And we know that God miraculously sustained him. God mirac miraculously took him out. And so the word for you today is, you will be sustained in your wilderness. You will be sustained in your midbar. Remember the Hebrew word for wilderness? It's midbar. So you will be sustained in your midbar, in your wilderness. And uh, the 40 days, Yeshua did in the wilderness because as we look at Moses I said he was a Moses was a foreshadow of the minis, of of the Messiah and so we look at Israel for example going through 40 years in the wilderness and here is Yeshua he is going through the will he is in the wilderness for 40 days in prayer and struggle right and each of 
the day he spent in the wilderness is basically a representative of each year that Israel had to go through in the wilderness. And so they encountered temptations, they encountered all kinds of testings, and the truth is, for most of it, they, they created it upon themselves. But even in in there, right? In 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 the in the in the testings and the temptations and the trials and everything, God was with them in the wilderness because he promised that he will never leave them. And uh, I love this text from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2 to 3, right? Because God says, you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. He humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna which you did not know nor did your fathers know that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone. In the wilderness, they were sustained miraculously. Right? They didn't have to make any provision at all for themselves. What a life that was in the wilderness, really. They didn't have to make any provision for themselves. Everything they need were provided for them. And God used these moments as testing moments to know what was in their heart, whether they would keep his commandments or not, if they would be humble. Right? He said, He said, He humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. People of God, this is a great reminder for all of us today. It's a great reminder that when you go through the wilderness experiences of life. Count it pure joy. That's what the apostle James says. Count it pure joy when you fall into diverse temptation because you know that God is working it all out for your good, right? He is taking you to a place to get your attention. So, so you can hear him clearly. What is it he wants to say to you? Wherever you're at in your life right now is for a reason. You just need to pull back a bit and allow the spirit of the Lord to speak to you and to hear exactly what he is saying in this moment in your life. But so you know, the wilderness is not such a bad place. It's not a bad place. It's a place of learning and it's a place of being drawn closer to God, right? The wilderness is not just a wilderness right? It is not just a wilderness. From a biblical point of view, we see it is the place where God appears and he speaks to his people. It is the place where God appears and he sustains his people. It is the place where God appears and he ministers to his people, right? And let me leave a word of caution with you, though. Um... As you go through the wilderness, you can't just remain, you can't be in a passive mood, really. You can't be passive in the wilderness. You have to be empowered in the word and use the word, right? You have to be empowered in the word and use the word. That was exactly what Jesus did, you know, when he was tempted by the enemy. He said, Man, it is written in verse 4, St. Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Absolutely every word that comes from the mouth of God. Right? You need the word of God. You have to you have to you have to be grounded in the word of God. You have to be rooted in the word of God. Right? Man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And it says, the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. 
If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is also written, do not put the Lord God to the test, to have to know the word. Right? Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give to you, he said, if you will bow and worship me. Can you imagine? He, he's making big promises and he didn't own anything. None of these things belong to him. Right? Um, Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. People of God, in the wilderness you grow in the wilderness you mature because a lot of other stuff happen in the wilderness you know it's a place of pruning also right jesus said the, the the tree that does not bear good fruit it's pruned it's a place of pruning it's a place where where you get rid of some stuff as the spirit of the lord will bring revelation because revelation took place in the wilderness, you will get revelation in the wilderness. You get revelation through the word of the Lord. And it was after Jesus or Yeshua said, get behind me, right? The enemy left him. So to overcome the enemy, to overcome doubt and fear about your wilderness experience, you have to use the word. The devil in St. Mark chapter 1 verse 13, it says, The devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Can I tell you something today? God will never, ever, ever leave you alone. You don't believe me? Look at what he did to Israel. Look at what he did to Israel, and it is not done. The promise remains, and the promise continues. And I want to, I want you to receive the blessing from the word of God that that which you are going through, the wilderness of your soul, it is not as bad as you believe. But if you look on it from a different perspective, you are going to see that this place is a holy place where you will encounter the living God. I pray that you will be blessed by what you have heard. And I pray that this word will help your walk with the Lord. And for those of you who are listening and you have not yet come into a relationship, for those of you who are listening and you don't know him, you don't know him because you are still in that place of narrowness. You are still in Egypt. Now is the opportune time for you to come out of Egypt, to come out of the Egypt of this world and come into this personal walk that is going to take you into your promised land. Thank you for listening. And my prayers are over you always. May God bless you richly. Thank you. Thank you. Until we meet again, thank you.